Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. My name is Sophie. Good evening, and thank you for tuning in. We here at Books and Books, an independently owned bookstore in Miami, Florida, are so delighted to welcome you to a virtual evening with Christine Keneally and James Carroll to discuss the new book, Ghosts of the Orphanage, published by our friends at Public Affairs. A bit about our guest, Christine Keneally is an award-winning journalist and author who has written for The New Yorker, The New York Times, Slate, Time, and other publications. Her BuzzFeed story about crimes committed at St. Joseph Orphanage was viewed more than 6 million times in six months. It won a Deadline Award and was a finalist for a National Magazine Award, a Michael Kelly Award, and an Online Journalism Award. It was shortlisted for the Fedisoff Prize. A native of Australia, Keneally also has lived in New York, Iowa, and England, where she earned a PhD in linguistics from Cambridge University. She lives in Melbourne, Australia with her family. Moderating tonight's event, James Carroll is the author of 11 novels and eight works of nonfiction. He is the winner of the National Book Award. His most recent book, and the reason for being in conversation with Christine Keneally, is The Truth at the Heart of the Lie, How the Catholic Church Lost the Soul. Just a quick reminder, you can post any questions you have below in the Ask a Question feature at the bottom of the screen. I highly encourage your participation. This is an incredibly important conversation. We will be answering them at the end. Please order your copies of Ghosts of the Orphanage from Books and Books and support independent bookstores. Now, without further ado, I'd like to welcome our guests to the virtual stage. Hi, Jim. Hello, my friends. And Christine, there you are. First, let me thank you, Sophie, for that introduction. And we, Christine and I are so honored to be in the platform sponsored by Books and Books, the greatest bookstore in the United States of America. <laughs> you as an Australian, Christine, may not know what an honor this is. We're also hosted by the great bookseller of Books and Books, Mitch Kaplan. Okay. Who's, who's a prophet in the world of literature in the United States of America. Uh, what a privilege and honor it is for me to be here, Christine, talking with you about this hugely important book. I'm going to hold it up so that folks can recognize it at the bookstore. Ghosts of the Orphanage, a hugely gripping uh, and urgently important story about the fate that befell thousands and thousands of children in a network of orphanages across the world and in a special way in the English speaking world in the United States of America. If there was a theme for us tonight, Christine, it strikes me that it was articulated years and years ago by a Catholic, a British Catholic named uh, known as Lord Acton, who in opposing the Vatican's declaration of the infallibility of the Pope in the 19th century said, power corrupts, absolute power corrupts, absolutely. I know you know that. And your uh, book gives us a contemporary crushing example of the truth of that, of that saying, power corrupts, absolute power corrupts absolutely. And uh, as a couple of people who come out of the experience of Roman Catholicism, it's especially uh, pointed uh, mm. story. Um, it is. I'm, go I'm going to, in a minute, ask you to read from your book, but say a word of greeting to our, to our uh, participants tonight, Christine. Say hello. Thank you so much for coming, everybody. We can't see you, but we know you're there, and we really appreciate your presence and your interest in this important topic. Christine, I thought it would be uh, important for uh, the people who are with us tonight in the few, min few moments that you and I have to discuss your book before we open it to their questions and comments. If they could hear your own voice uh, introducing the book, would you read that uh, passage that you and I discussed earlier uh, as a way of telling us about the book? Yeah, I would love to. Thank you for asking, Jim. And um, let me know if it's not loud enough. Okay, so from page 12, 
For most of the 20th century, an invisible archipelago stretched across the Western world. On each island in the chain stood a large dark manor, some of red brick, some of stone. Most stood two to four stories tall and all were utilitarian, though often graced by the statue of a saint or an architectural note, a pretty gable here, a cupola there. The hulking great buildings sat on the edge of their towns, high on a hill, by the river, or on the outskirts in the fields where few lived. They loomed large and solitary, and if the people in the nearby town thought of them at all, they thought of them as one-off institutions. Few understood that they belonged to an enormous, silent network. In fact, between St. Augustine's in Victoria, Australia, and St. Joseph's in Vermont, the United States, existed thousands of other institutions like them. Smilham Park, Orphanage in Lancashire, Scotland, the Bon Secours Mother and Baby Home in Tuam Island, the Mount Providence Orphanage in Montreal, Canada. Most institutions were religious, but many were not. All told, they composed the 20th century orphanage system through which millions of children passed and from which relatively few records remain. Christine, say uh, another few words about what your book will tell readers um, to make specific this vast network, this vast hidden network that you're uh, describing. What, right. what, does your book, what does your book tell us and how did you come to it? So um, the book essentially is set in context of this massive orphanage system, but then specific homes that I zoom in on. Um, and I really, I tell this large arc of history primarily through the experience of individuals and mostly individual survivors who spent some amount of time in these orphanages. Um, there's so much to say about them. Some people were there for six months a year. Some people were there for 10 or 20 years. And their experiences were nothing like the experience of their peers in the outside world at that time. They almost went into a complete other universe when they went inside orphanages. The, the rules were different. The treatment was incredibly different. There was an extraordinary amount of dehumanization. Um, and I can talk more about that at length, but just to explain how I got into it, um, actually it began in Australia. So I'm, I'm a journalist who's worked in the States for a long time and I also work in Australia. I was based in Australia when I came across this story. Uh, I went to a conference of archivists and I just stumbled into a presentation talking about the information that was taken from a group of people during the 20th century, really basic information about who they were, whether they had siblings, where they might have come from, who their parents were or their larger family. And it was so extraordinary to me. I couldn't imagine not having that information about myself. And, you know, it's not just like a missing uncle or a sister who left home early. It's just a massive sort of absence of all these anchor points that we have to our lives. So the archivist presenting uh, this, this, um, this situation spoke about it as a human rights issue because not only had this information been taken from people in the first place, it had, uh, it, you know, no one was urgently going about trying to restore it to them. Archivists were often on the receiving end of requests for help, but the institutions or the legacy remnants of institutions where these people had been essentially incarcerated as children weren't really doing anything about it themselves. They were often quite hostile when people came asking for information. So it was just an incredible situation to me. I just I struggled to imagine how that could happen to people. And then I started reporting. And so I I think I got one of those presenters to put me in touch with someone in that world, someone who'd survived an orphanage. They put me in touch with someone else. I met a man called Jeff Meyer and he told me his story. He spent time at a place called Royalston in New South Wales. And Jeff um, was a beautiful, lovely, mild-mannered man who had lived through a howl that many of us can't begin to contemplate and, and struggle to, to imagine. Um, he experienced abuse and Jeff's story is like many of the stories. There was sexual abuse at Royalston, there was physical abuse, there was emotional abuse. And I want to just make the point 
as I mentioned that, that not all, but a significant number of survivors who told me that experienced all kinds of abuse in these places found the emotional abuse was the most harmful for them the longest. It's the things that were said to them, that kind of cruelty that stayed with them for many, many decades after. Um, and just essentially dehumanization was characteristic of these places. And the different survivors that I spoke to experienced that in many different ways. But one of the most common elements was setting rules for the children. They're like you know, it's like the darkest fairy tale you could possibly imagine, setting rules that were impossible to correctly follow and then punishing the kids when they couldn't follow them. I ended up reporting at St. Joseph's uh, in Vermont, in Burlington, Vermont, and one of the rules there was that the kids had to sleep in a particular position every single night and that if they didn't, they were punished. And I keep returning to this as I talk about the orphanage, but it's just, it's so completely mad. This idea that a child could hold their position while asleep, let alone no adult could do that. So Christine, you, you, you give us a, a, a glimpse of this world, well, not the, of this transnational system, secret system of incarceration for children. Is that too strong a phrase? No, I would no. absolutely use Incarceration that. Incarceration for children. We have fantasies of what an orphanage is. We have romantic notions. You refer to Little Orphan Annie and Shirley Temple. But the portrait you bring to us is of unrelenting misery, uh, including at times uh, physical and sexual abuse, but generally a system of discipline that is inhuman and inhumane. But then you bring us, um, much of your book is focused on one place in particular. And I think it would help readers to hear a bit more about St. Joseph's in Burlington, Vermont. Yeah. Uh, a place that's familiar to us. I mean, if not that particular place, the idea of that place is familiar. Tell us about St. Joseph's and give us the story, for example, of one character who is one of these heroic survivors who has helped us reckon with this history. Yes, so I wanna talk about Sally Dale, but I also need to say that I spoke to many survivors of St. Joseph's and certainly some people didn't want to talk about it, couldn't still talk about it. It was still too upsetting, it was not possible. But I spoke to many incredibly generous people who told me their stories. And for many people, it, it cost them something even now to tell their stories. The trauma is so profound. It goes back so far. And it has been so unvalidated over the years. It has been so invisible. It's just, it's an incredibly challenging thing to do. So many extraordinary people, but yes. Forgive me for interrupting. St. Joseph's is the name of the orphanage in Burlington, Vermont. That's right. Give us the basic data about that. It began when it closed as an orphanage when? Yeah. What did it become? And then how did you penetrate the mystery of it? Yes. Your, your, own, uh, your own investigation, the years you spent, and uh, the chapter one, chapter two, chapter three, quickly about St. Joseph's. Yeah, so um, I'm I'm not going to get the date exactly right. It was built in the late 1800s. It's lasted for about 120 years. It's housed over the course of its lifetime 13,000 children. Those children were called orphans, but certainly in the years in which I was able to very closely study the institution from the late 1930s through to the 1970s, very few of them were actually orphans. That was actually quite unusual. Um, mostly were kids who'd lost one parent, either to illness or abandonment or death. Um, sometimes they had both parents, but the parents had divorced. And, you know, in the case of St. Joseph's, you know, the priest had encouraged the mother to relinquish one or two or some of her children to the institution to give her a break, to, you know, let the nuns educate them for a change. Really heartbreakingly, Sally Dale, who was at St. Joseph's for 20 years, 
love Shirley Temple. You mentioned Shirley Temple before, and one of the sort of highlights and happiness, uh, you know, moments of happiness in her life was when they showed Shirley Temple films, which were almost contemporaneous, I guess. You know, I think they were 1930s. She was born in 1938. Um, it's extraordinary to imagine these kids living through these Dickensian grim machines um, whilst looking at lovely little orphans on the screen and imagining, you know, that they're sort of the cute, happy life. So Sally's really important to this story because Sally was at St. Joseph's for 20 years. She, um, she was there longer than anyone else that I came across except for a lady who had never left and became a kind of a servant of the nuns. And weirdly enough, there was at least one or two of those in every institution I looked at as well, these poor lonely women that never actually left. Sally, um, along with a number of survivors, came forward in the 1990s to talk about what happened to her at St. Joseph's. She experienced sexual abuse from the nuns. Uh, she experienced sexual abuse from priests. She was physically abused and she was just injured in ways that are so painful to imagine. She was pushed down the stairs and she broke, a, uh, I think it was a bone in her leg, but she wasn't properly helped. She was taken to the hospital, put together in a cast, and then the nuns refused to give her Panadol that night. That, I mean, that's the kind of mindset of the place that we're, you know, we're dealing with here. Christine Sally Dale's story is a heroic tale and readers should read your book, if only to encounter her. Uh, we don't have a lot of time. I, I think one of the things that's powerful about your uh, reporting is that you show how this structure of incarceration for children is uh, transnational, but it is also very particular in many, many, if not most cases, a Roman Catholic phenomenon. Sally Dale, who brought her complaint, her truth, her story forward in the 1990s, was essentially not believed. And you give us the history of any number of heroic survivors who were not believed. And then something changed in the early 2000s. Tell us what changed, and then tell us what you discovered uh, after further revelations of the scandal of Roman Catholic abuse of children. Uh, it may be, my, my screen tells me that we have a connection problem with Christine. Yes, my screen also says that. So I think we may need to wait for her connection to come back. As soon as it comes back, I'll yield to her. But uh, let me just tell those of you who are listening here, because it's so urgently important that in this book, Christine shows us how, for a decade, the survivors of St. Joseph's in Burlington in particular were not believed, uh, and they were essentially stonewalled by the church authorities. And then in the early 2000s, especially after the Boston Globe, uh, now famous Spotlight series, Christine, you were frozen for a moment. Oops. Uh, fr fr freezing again. Anyway, yeah. after, after the Boston Globe Spotlight series uh, demonstrated the radical and radically shocking truth of uh, not only the raping of children by priests, but the almost universal preference of bishops to protection of the predators instead of the victims, that once that uh, deluge began to break open, something about the truth of what had been happening in the orphanages and the Catholic orphanages and St. Joseph's in particular became uh, undenied and undeniable. Christine, tell us that story. Jim, I'm sorry, I only caught half of your question, but you were, you were talking about how these institutions were primarily Catholic and that that was very important for the experience both of the kids in the orphanages and in the 1990s when they came forward. Is that, am I? Yes, but I, I'm, I think for in the brief time we have, it's important for folks to hear that uh, something broke into the open after the priest sex abuse scandal itself was laid bare in the early 2000s, which then affected how the story of the survivors of St. Joseph's 
and other orphanages uh, were heard. Could right. you tell us that story? Especially, I'm thinking of the transcripts that you uncovered or that were finally revealed. Yes. Um, of the church's own investigation into the very priests who had been denying, denying, denying at St. Joseph's. That's Would you right. Tell us that story. That's right. I'd love to. And like, let me just paint a little bit more detail for the 1990s, because that's very relevant to what I was able to unearth in, you know, after the 2006 records were released. So as Jim said before, people came forward, they weren't believed, they participated in a process of litigation, which is, of course, very difficult in the most normal of circumstances. It's a very combative process. It's a process where having lots of money is quite an advantage. None of these people had lots of money. Um, but it was also a process where these individuals, so courageous, still so traumatized about what they'd gone through, they found just enough resources to finally come out and, you know, seek justice. And in this process of litigation, no doubt under the instruction or certainly at the wishes of the defense, which included the Diocese of Burlington, the Sisters of Providence, and a social work agency called Vermont Catholic Charities, lawyers questioned witnesses in, in a way that was entirely traumatizing itself. To sort of stand there when someone is so clearly affected by their experience, even just to express hostile skepticism is is unpleasant and unnecessary for that process enough. But um, but these people were often humiliated while they were just trying to tell their story. So it was really traumatic and it failed. People's cases were dismissed or they had to settle. There were priests and nuns who gave depositions in the same process. One in particular, I think is characteristic, he best exemplifies what a lot of them did, which is that they were very confident very cocky um, and kind of offended, you know, definitely wanting to express their sort of personal and professional sense of offense at these charges that were being laid against them. During that litigation, documentation was entered into the process, such as a whole bunch of files from the diocese, including files for priests who were being questioned in the, de in the depositions. Those files on their face were hard to accept as legitimate. They were, you know, priest files for priests who'd been priests for four decades and they were one to two pages long. You know, they had very little in them and yet that's what the diocese handed over. In 2006, after Spotlight, a judge forced the church, forced the diocese to hand over a massive amount of documentation because of a parish priest sex abuse case that was, you know, being tried in the wake of Spotlight. Um, not many people, I think, realized it at the time when I came to it years later and started trawling through that information, I realized that much of it was the missing files that should have been there in the 1990s, files that as a whole showed how fundamentally dishonest the church's engagement was with that process, just completely dishonest. But more specifically than that, including that priest who I just mentioned, the one who was so offended on behalf of the poor sisters who did nothing but their best apparently for the children, that included a letter from a rehab facility that he had recently spent time at for the sexual abuse of children and also including way too late in that man's career, the recommendation that he not be left alone with kids. So here we have, I, I began our conversation by quoting absolute power corrupts absolutely. The structure of the Catholic Church, this isn't just a Catholic story, but it's a, there's a way in which it's an essentially Catholic story. Certainly you and I both have a special feel for that. But if this power structure with uh, bishops and priests on top, nuns are at the bottom, but uh, every it's, it's, it's sucking up and hitting down, slapping down, and it, the priests slap down to the nuns and the nuns slap down to the vulnerable people they're given who are the children. Yeah. And what, the, and what those texts you're talking about, the transcripts of the diocese's own investigation showed is that in the period you were most concerned with, with, with witnesses and testimony, six of the eight chaplains at St. Joseph's Orphanage, correct me if I have this wrong, mm 
six of the eight chaplains, that is to say, the person at the mythic top of the power structure in the orphanage, six of them were credibly accused predators, as, yes. as it turned out. And that was all hidden from the litigants in the 1990s. Now, yes. is that right? And what did you make of it when you discovered it? That is right. And, you know, I just, I knew what I was looking for. I knew what the survivors had told me was true. But as the numbers kept adding up, as I was sort of piecing together bits of information in these documents, I just could not believe that it was, you know, two, three, four, five, six of eight. In addition to which, let me just add that I couldn't find any documentation about the other two. So I'm not saying either way what kind of people they were. They were only at the orphanage for a very brief time. So for the almost this entire four uh, decade period, the priest who was treated very much by the nuns as God, as God, whose rule, whose word was law, you know, he was a credibly accused abuser. The nuns themselves, many of them were credibly accused abusers too. Um, there were visitors, visiting priests who came and abused children. You know, obviously the predators who we think we know so much about, right? Since Spotlight, we think we know so much about predator priests, but really the focus has been on parish priests. Um, but these men clearly knew that children inside those institutions were vulnerable. There was no transparency to the outside world and they could walk in and walk out and do what they wanted. So priests came and left. Um, the nuns were abusers as well. You know, when the orphanage was first built, Bishop de Gosbriand, who was the first bishop of Burlington and who was the man who started the orphanage, he lived there. He retired there. I found that very interesting. There were old people in the home at that time, like for many of these orphanages in their first sort of 20, 30 years there was a kind of combination, old people's home and orphanage. But um, I found it very bizarre that he chose to live in an orphanage. Christine, you spent 10 years of your life pursuing this. You describe it at one point, maybe you're quoting someone as Dante's Inferno. You've been into the circles of hell here. There's a way in which the human depravity of the way in which these children were systematically abused, not by individuals only, but also by an entire system that claimed sacred power for itself. What what did this do to you? How do you you started out as a Catholic, I think? Uh, what did it do to you? How does this leave you feeling about uh, us human beings, about uh, about religion, about power? What what can yes. I ask you to speak personally to us for a moment about what this oh. decade of your life has done to you? Um, I was raised Catholic. I wouldn't have described myself as Catholic by the time I got to this story. Um, but I did, did feel, I think, a special obligation to do something about the corruption of Catholics. Like it, that felt kind of personal to me and that felt important in a way. Um, and I certainly didn't intend to spend 10 years on this story by any stretch. It just kept going and going and going. And expanding and every additional story was really important in the sort of massive accumulation of evidence from all the different testimonies of the children just at St. Joseph's and also at other places too. I just felt such a personal obligation to record them all. At times the stories became really tough and I, um, you know, I had to take a break, even just, you know, during the day, go for a walk, just, the sadness of some of the stories was really hard. Um, and I had to come up with different strategies to cope with the sense of loss and tragedy. But certainly for me now, having sort of traced this huge arc, what I've seen since um, the 2018 BuzzFeed News article, which this book you know, expands on considerably, is survivors assembling again. Um, a lot of attention happened in 2018. A lot of survivors reconnected with each other. The state attorney general started a restorative justice process and they have done so much. They've achieved so much. They've changed statutes of limitations in Vermont. They really care about children, not just about what happened to them, but about children going forward. 
they um, participated in a criminal investigation. They're building a memorial garden. And uh, I feel selfish or weird to make that about me in any way, but I can tell you that it was an undreamed of positive resolution and that it just has given back to me so much strength and happiness and awe to see humans. So, you know, you asked what I think of humanity. Um, I'm still shocked by how bad humans can be. I, I still, I still feel driven to sort of keep going somehow down this road. I'm not sure how. Um, I want the perpetrators to come to justice. I want the liars to be exposed. Well, um, you know, the, the survivors to whom you paid tribute early in our conversation are, uh, are at the center of this story, but you are the person more than anyone else when it comes to this particular uh, story of orphanages who are bringing their voice to the broader world. And I really salute you, Christine. Thank you. What you've done in this book is so important. I think it's a moment for us to turn to questions or input from people who are on the call this evening. But I do want to conclude our part of the conversation by paying tribute to you. What you've done is urgently important. And, Thank you so much, Jim. Um, it, carries, it carries great weight. Thank you. Sophie, uh, are you going to broaden out the conversation for us? I am actually going to move on to the Q&A portion of this event. Um, Jim, Christine, thank you guys so much on behalf of Books and Books. This was extremely enlightening. And if anybody has any more questions to add on, now is your time to do so. We will be answering them right now. So we have a question from Patrick William. Um, how hard will it be to get the Diocese of Burlington to admit the abuse really occurred? And will they really turn over the list of abusive nuns like they did the priests of the Diocese of Vermont? And I, I think Patrick also included a point that the Attorney General ruled there was no evidence of documentation of the abuse happening ever at the St. Joseph's Orphanage to hold the diocese at all accountable. Oh, I'm sorry. I am I think I misread the question. I think he's asking if there was any documentation at all to hold the diocese accountable. And yeah. will the lists ever Will that ever happen? Yeah, yeah. Great and important question. Let me just say about the second part, the State Attorney General did conduct a criminal investigation and absolutely in the report that came out of that, a 200-page report, I believe, validated all the stories of abuse. There were some very important stories of deaths and murder that I also investigated and the State Attorney General could not find evidence of those. That's what he said he couldn't find evidence of. But, you know, the absence of evidence is certainly not evidence of absence and not when it comes to stories from 50 or 60 years ago. There's a lot of really powerful circumstantial evidence around those stories. And I'm positive had they been investigated at the right time, different results would have come out of it. As far as the names of the nuns, let me tell you that in 2019, the Diocese of Burlington published a list of 40 priests who'd been credibly accused. There were no women on that list. So that was 2019. That's more than 20 years after a massive number of survivors credibly accused an enormous number of nuns. Um, the names somehow have made them onto the list. They are in public records. The diocese absolutely has access to them. And who knows what the diocese or the Sisters of Providence have behind closed doors in their archives. The Sisters of Providence refused to engage with the criminal investigation. I asked the diocese just about a month ago what they were doing about those women, why there weren't women included on the list. They did not respond to me. Later, they issued a let's say, characteristic statement to NBC5, who I spoke to, and they said it was something along the lines of apologizing for the missteps, missteps of those who came before them. I, I think if people organize around this, those women will be included, and I think that's a really important issue. I think it needs to happen. Survivors of the abuse of women need to be recognized too. Thank you. And we have another question from K.O. who said, my grandfather was at St. Joseph's in the early 1900s. He's been deceased since the 1980s. What time period does your book cover? How many children went through St. Joseph's? 
overall 13,000. Um, my book primarily covers the late 1930s to the early 1970s, and that's because that's when I was able to access most records and also speak to survivors. Um, I believe that that period that your grandfather was there was um, a really significant one. I know that there are census materials that you can potentially find his name on. I know that there are death records for children who died at the orphanage in that time. Um, and I think there are a lot of kids there basically between the 1900s and the 1930s. We have another question from Jorge who asked, have you heard of Operation Pedro Pan, which happened in the early 60s with Cuban children who some experienced this abuse as they lived in orphanage, orphanages in the US? I have heard horror stories. Oh, that's such an important question and a really good one. So yeah, I had a whisper of that. So Don Bosco was um, briefly a sort of an annex of St. Joseph's. I think it only lasted for 10, 15 years. I really wanna know why the church shut it down. There are no records that I could find about that. Older teenage boys um, went to Don Bosco. So from the age of 14 or something like that, they would spend the next few years at Don Bosco's, which was just, you know, 100 feet, 50 feet away. I did track down a priest um, who spent his time there. I, I know of numerous abusive priests who were there, and that priest did mention kids from Cuba. So I think some did spend time at St. Joseph's. I'm sorry, I wasn't able to come across more information, but that took me by surprise. I hadn't heard it before. So I think that happened there. I think those are all the questions that we have for tonight. Um, again, on behalf of Books and Books, I really want to thank you guys for hopping on here and letting us host your story because this is so incredible. This is so important to share and I really salute you. Um, so yeah, I wish you guys a wonderful night and I wish the audience a wonderful night and I really encourage everyone to buy Ghost of the Orphanage. Um, we have a green button right below our faces where you can click and your the link will take you to our uh, shop where you can buy it. So thank you Sophie, everyone. If, Sophie, before we go, mm -hmm. if I if it's not presumptuous of me, I think our, our people on the call would love to hear a final word about this very important book that Christine has published. Christine, I, I proposed to you earlier in our conversation that you close our evening with a brief reading that concludes uh, this important question you've put before us. Would you do that? Yes, thanks, Jim. Um, okay, this is page 58. Given modern efforts to acknowledge injustices in American history, it's extraordinary that the orphanage system has remained invisible. We know a great deal about the long lasting legacy of many catastrophic practices from the 19th and 20th centuries and before, yet we know next to nothing about the millions of lives affected by this perverse system of warehousing children and worse. It's not just orphans who've kept silent. State governments and religious organization have been so keen to forget what happened that even though substantial money passed through orphanages, it's hard to find definitive records to describe the system. More than a decade into the 21st century, orphanages remain a significant but almost wholly missing part of American history. My friends, ghosts of the orphanage, ghosts are famous for not having a voice. Christine Keneally has given these ghosts a voice. This is an important book. I strongly encourage you to get it. Thank Christine, you so much. Christine, too. thank you so much. Thank Sophie, you. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, to, thanks to Books and Books and the uh, great Mitch Kaplan also. I'm going to be ending the broadcast now. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.